Well, uh, first an apology. I'm sorry not to speak French. It's, it's my loss. Um, I was always bad at languages. The last test I did in Latin, I got four out of 50. <laughs> and I was allowed to give up Latin and French. <laughs> but uh, I'm sorry. Um, I'm an epidemiologist. I was one of the first people to go into epidemiology without doing medicine first. So I was one of the first... I did put it on. Is it not coming out? You can... Uh, is that any different? No. It, ah, there. No. <laughs> um, I'll have to talk more quietly. <laughs> um, uh, so I was one of the first people into epidemiology from the social sciences. I did economic history for my first degree and different questions arise. And really people I think from that background into epidemiology, what we focused on was health inequalities, the big social class differences in health um, <coughs> in most societies. And so what, I've, what I'm going to tell you really comes out of that. Um, I suppose I worked in that field for 35, 40 years um, and uh, what I can tell you depends on work from people around the world, not just our work. Um, I like to start off with this slide because it shows how miserable we all are. I'm not sure you look quite as miserable as these people. But uh, these are outside uh, Oxford Street tube station in the middle of London. They're all young people going to reasonable jobs. They're not unemployed or homeless. And every face is anxious, depressed, uh, miserable. You know, she looks as if she's about to have a, a nervous break breakdown. <laughs> I always fear that it, I'll be giving a talk using this slide and someone will say, that's me! <laughs> <laughs> but not so far. And it reminds me that part of what I think I'm interested in is the contrast between the material well-being of our societies uh, and the many forms of um, uh, psychosocial uh, problems of different kinds. You know, if you look at levels of mental illness or at self-harm amongst teenage girls or drug problems or violence or anything else, we don't live in the sort of social utopia which, I mean, if people in the 19th century had said how we would be living now um, with central heating and air conditioning and cars and DVDs, they, they would have think this was a social utopia but we're a long way from it. Um, I'm going to talk about inequality, which since we wrote our book, it's moved up the agenda, the political agenda, very fast. And this is some quotes from uh, Barack Obama, uh, Pope Francis, Christine Lagarde. Uh, this is Ban Ki-moon. Um, uh, it's uh, dropped off the bottom, but they're all saying now that inequality is one of the most important is issues political issues. Um, I'm going to show you a lot of slides with graphs on. Um, I like to start with this that isn't about inequality. It shows life expectancy and national income per person in different countries. So it's, it's national income per head and you see the rapid rises in the early stages of economic development. Rapid rises in life expectancy and then it flattens out. Uh, so the rich developed countries are there. Um, you can see Canada just there. Can you see this point from the back? Um, and uh, so if you look at countries from somewhere there to there, it doesn't make any difference whether you're as rich as Norway and the USA or as poor as uh, uh, New Zealand and Greece and um, countries like that. It's important, that curve is important because if you look at not life expectancy but happiness or other measures of well-being you find the same pattern. Rapid rises in the early stages of economic growth and then it levels off. 
it's not a ceiling effect. You know, we haven't reached the limits of human life expectancy. Life expectancy is still increasing by two or three years with every ten years that passes. Um, but it's no longer related to uh, economic growth, nor is happiness, nor other measures of well-being. So I think we in the developed world have got to the end of the real benefits of economic growth. Economic growth is what's transformed the real quality of our lives, but it's largely finished its work. You know, it's really important for people in the poorer countries to have higher material standards, but for us in the rich world, having more and more of everything makes less and less difference. This is basically a curve of diminishing returns to, to rises in income, rises in material standards. Bound to see it sometime, um, but it's happening. Um, but, uh, sorry, even, even if you look at long periods of change, you know, the last graph was just a cross-section, but even if you look at change over time, there's very little relationship. Um, <coughs> uh, even 40 years, you don't see much connection between economic growth over 40 years and changes in life expectancy. Um, I'm going to talk just about these rich developed countries. This is the same data, so it's taking the countries that were there on that earlier one, still life expectancy and gross national income, but it just emphasises that it doesn't help at all to be twice as rich here as those countries. It's not just that there isn't a significant relationship, statistically significant relationship with uh, um, national income, there's nothing there at all. Um, but within all our societies, there are these extraordinary gradients in health. I'm sorry, this is, is uh, data from England and Wales. These are small areas, local neighbourhoods. Uh, they're classified by their levels of deprivation, how rich or poor they are. So the poorest ones have low life expectancy and the richest ones have high life expectancy. This is quite old data, uh, all those bars now are a little bit taller. Um, but you see, this is, this is not just about, this is not a difference between the poor and everyone else. Uh, if you think about homelessness or unemployment, that's a contribution to this end. But to understand this, you've got to have a, an explanation of why these people, just below the top, do less well. It's a gradient right across our society. You cannot understand health inequalities if you, think it, if you just think in terms of the material effects of poverty. Michael Marmot, who I suppose is the foremost researcher in this field, says you can take away all the effects of poverty and ill health and you've still got most of the problem of health inequalities left. But look, there's an extraordinary contrast. Income made no difference between these countries. Differences in average income and within the societies, it's so important. That's a paradox. And I think the explanation of the paradox is that within our societies, we're looking at relative income or social position social status, where we are in relation to each other. And as soon as you've got that idea, that it's about social ordering, where we are in relation to each other, you should start to think, what happens if we make the differences between us bigger or smaller? And that's really what I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you a lot more data and then I'm going to try and explain the relation, why the, these relationships exist, what's going on behind the data. Uh, and just in case you, I, I, this, uh, I, I'm afraid I've put these slides together just as you were coming in because I was going to give you a quite a different lecture. Um, but then when I heard the interests of people who are likely to be here, I thought I should do something slightly different. Uh, so I've put in a few rather old slides of Canadian data. So this is self-reported health um, with different levels of, of deprivation and you see the sort of fourfold differences in the proportion of the population with uh, fair or poor self-related health. This is Vancouver. So, you know, we all have these health inequalities. Um, 
I often think there are two views of inequality. One is um, a sort of uh, what I call a naive view, that inequality only matters if it creates um, poverty or pe if people think it's very unfair. That's a view that many people have. I think it's the dominant view of uh, inequality. It only matters if it creates poverty and people see it as very unfair. But actually, there's something much more fundamental going on. More to do with increasing feelings of superiority and inferiority, dominance and subordination, uh, things that fit into our evolved psychology in ways I'm going to show you. Um, including anxieties about our self-worth and uh, status competition and so on. The data we use is simply looking at um, the scale of income differences between the top 20% in each country and the bottom 20%. How big is that gap? Um, and you see in the more equal societies, this data, we, all our data we just download from international agencies. So this came from the UN. Uh, other data I'll show you comes from WHO or OECD. We, we never decide what data is comparable with what. We just use what the international agencies have. Um, but you see, in these countries, Japan, Finland, Norway, Sweden, the top 20% is getting three and a half or four times as much as the bottom 20%. But in countries over here, the gap is twice as big. They're getting eight or nine times as much. Um, you'll see Canada in all my graphs uh, in the middle, whenever, almost always the inequality data, if it's, our, if it's graphs that we've done as opposed to other studies that I will show you sometimes, um, <coughs> the uh, Canada will always be in the middle because we use this lev measure of inequality along the bottom. Uh, so if you want to find Canada, it'll be somewhere above the the middle, depending on what's on the uh, vertical axis. We put together an index of um, all the major problems with, with social gradients. When I say with social gradients, I mean gradients that uh, these problems are more common at the bottom of society, like ill health. Remember, this comes out of our work on health inequalities. Uh, and lots of things have a similar social gradient. So violence is more common at the bottom of society. Teenage births are more common. Uh, mental illness is more common. Uh, so we downloaded international data for each of those countries on all these things, how much people feel they can trust others. Mental illness in the standard psychiatric classification includes drug and alcohol addiction and some figures on social mobility. We put them into one index, and here it is, uh, that index of health and social problems um, related to that measure of income inequality I showed you. And I said Canada would always be in the middle, so there it is. Um, and what it's showing is that the more unequal countries, USA, Portugal, and UK, have more of all those problems than these more equal countries down here. Um, and if you look at the same data, exactly the same data for each country up the side, but here related gross to gross national income, there's no relationship. Um, we were worried that people would think that we had chosen problems to suit our argument. Uh, in fact, you can see we've got all the major problems you might expect to find comparable international data, problems with social gradients. Uh, but because of that worry, we looked at the UNICEF Index of Child Wellbeing. Um, sorry, here it is. Um, <coughs> it's the UNICEF made up an index of child well-being. It has 40 components. So it contains um, what, what levels of <coughs> immunization there are amongst children. It contains children's maths and lit literacy scores in the international tests. It contains whether there is bullying at school, whether children can talk to their parents, all sorts of things like that. Um, and here you see that exactly the same measure of inequality, the more unequal countries are doing worse. And again, Canada in the middle, uh, you're quite close, the levels of child well-being in Canada are quite close to what you predict on the basis of a knowledge of income and distribution here. <coughs> 
Um, and uh, we did a paper in the British Medical Journal looking not only at the overall index but at its various components. Um, here is that same index in relation to national income per head and you see no relation. So we talk about child poverty as a problem, not distinguishing between absolute poverty and relative poverty, but the data makes it absolutely clear that absolute living standards no longer make the difference. It's relative standards. It's where you are in relation to others in your society. What matters is where children are in relation to the rest of us and how unequal <coughs> the societies they're growing up in are. Um, this is a, there's a new measure of uh, child well-being, an updated index from UNICEF um, which contains different, uh, some different components but it gives just the same picture. You know, this is 2013, the other was like 2003 or 2004, uh, so about 10 years between it. Um, if you, what's this, changes in inequality um, and child well-being. Uh, in this, we uh, restricted the measures of child well-being to the components that could be identified the same in, in, at each point in time and just looked at the change in those. And this, it's quite a wide scatter, but you see there's a statistically significant relationship um, between uh, rising inequality here and lower standards of uh, child well-being. Um, this is trust. How much people trust others in society? It's um, the World Values Survey has a question uh, um, do, uh, do you agree that most people can be trusted? Uh, other surveys ask questions like would people take advantage of you if they got the chance? Um, and uh, that they all seem to be uh, quite strongly related to inequality. I want to point out the level of differences. So here you've got what 15 or 20 percent of the population agreeing that they can that most people can be trusted. But in the more equal countries it rises to 60 or 65 percent. If you're walking home alone at night in one of our big cities you'd feel much safer doing that in one of the more equal societies. Uh, it really does feel different. It, you can sort of almost feel it in the air. Um, it's, it's remarkable. We did all this work twice. We did it on these countries internationally but as a separate test bed we repeated it amongst the, the 50 states of the United States. So we were asking just the same question, do the more unequal countries do worse? Uh, sorry, the more unequal American states do worse? And so here is um, this time um, from the uh, federal government's general social survey a similar measure of trust, a similar scatter, more unequal states having lower levels of, of interpersonal trust. This is mental illness. Um, difficult to compare levels of mental illness in different societies because, you know, if you depend on diagnosis and things like that, it depends how you access medical care, whether you have to pay to see your doctor and uh, all sorts of things to do with recognition. So WHO, the World Health Organization, in order to help us compare levels of mental illness in different societies, they use the same diagnostic interviews on random samples of the population. So they'd be asking about your sleep patterns, your appetite, your um, uh, feelings of self-worth, all sorts of questions like that that have been found to be diagnostic of um, mental illness. And up here you've got the percent of the population with any mental illness in the preceding year. And you see down here it's about 8%. And it goes up to three times that level. Three times as much uh, mental illness in more unequal societies. Um, this one is infant mortality. Um, the scale of differences isn't so large. Uh, you can see this regression line doesn't go through the middle of the points. It's being pulled down by Singapore here. 
I never believed that figure for Singapore. I didn't believe that our most unequal country had the lowest infant mortality. Um, but we had to put it in because it's what WHO has. Um, and uh, I gave some lectures in Singapore a few years ago and discovered one of the, the several different reasons why their infant mortality appears so low. But one of them, you know, it's a small city state and they don't want the population to get bigger through, um, well, it can, uh, people can get Singaporean nationality if they're born there or if they marry a Singapore, someone of Singaporean nationality. About 25% of their workers are migrant workers who come uh, in. They're the poorest 25% uh, and they're not allowed to have babies or to get married. They get a health check every six months and if you're pregnant or married you get sent home. So you take from the population the 25% where you'd expect infant mortality to be highest and just remove it from the picture. So that's one reason why, but I, I really point this out because people on the political right, on the far right, have suggested that we manufactured this evidence by picking and choosing data. We have an absolute rule that if our source, our source of data has data for one of the countries we're looking at, it goes into the analysis. On some of the graphs I've shown you, like the mental illness one, uh, there are only a small number of countries there. That's because WHO had not yet made measures of men uh, those same measures of mental illness in different countries. This is uh, oh yeah, I'm, this isn't. I don't think this should be here. Um, I wanted to talk about this later on, but in case I've put it in the wrong place, it might be repeated later on. This is schizophrenia. I'm going to show you a few things about um, mental illness. Oh yes, uh, uh, I showed you that overall mental, mental health is worse in more unequal societies and since we came out with that, with rather f little data, uh, people have looked at specific forms of mental illness, schizophrenia, depression um, and psychotic symptoms and there's uh, schizophrenia um, no, I, that slide was out of order. This is um, death rates amongst American states and Canadian provinces here. Um, the more equal ones this time, uh, this end, all, in all the other slides, the more unequal ones are this end. This is somebody else's. Uh, uh, Nancy Ross, who uh, works for StatCan and um, Michael Wilson used to um, and Jim Dunn, the three Canadians. Um, this is working age men where the relationship with uh, inequality is closest. Um, this is the proportion of income going to the bottom half of the population. So there in California, the bottom half of the population is getting 20% of society's income. The top half is getting the remaining 80% of society's income. Um, and Canada comes very much where you'd expect. This again has can Canada in it. This is homicide rates, um, again done by some Canadians, uh, Margot Daly and um, uh, Wilson, uh, sorry, Martin Daly and Margot Wilson, um, who I think were at McMaster. And uh, these uh, American states, Canadian provinces, but look at the scale of differences. You've got 15 homicides per million about there, and it goes up to 150. The graph in our book isn't so dramatic, partly because we don't include the Canadian provinces, um, but there, it's now a very well-established relationship. There are about 50 papers showing that in lots of different settings, violence seems to be more common in more unequal societies. Imprisonment. This is a log scale. Um, so the top gets compressed, otherwise this would go up in a great curve and the US would be on the ceiling. Um, I may say, you know, that in a way people know the data. If before I'd shown you any of this, I'd said which developed country has the highest uh, rates of violence? I think most of you had said, would have said US. Uh, if I'd said highest teenage births or highest pre um, pregnancy rates, maybe you knew that too about the US. 
It's also true of mental illness, the proportion of the population in prison. Um, their overall life expectancy is pretty poor compared to other developed countries. Um, and if I'd asked you which countries do well on these kinds of measures, I suspect a lot of you would have uh, had some sense that the Scandinavian countries do well. So in a sense we've got to explain why some countries do badly uh, to a great many of these things and others do much better. Um, but again, look at the differences. The fact that this is a log scale compresses the higher figures, so the intervening points are higher than you'd expect. So Japan is about 40 homicides per million and you've got, it goes up to 400, sorry, not homicides, prisoners. So basically some countries are locking up 10 times as many people, 10 times the proportion of the population of other countries. That is not mainly because of more crime. More crime is a contribution to it, but the most important part of it is um, uh, harsher sentencing. You get sent to prison more easily for smaller offences, uh, given longer sentences in the more unequal societies. And we have also find, found as another expression of a sort of hardening of social relations. You know, I don't know whether it's that there's less trust up and down the social hierarchy. I showed you some trust data earlier. Or whether it's more fear, the rich being afraid of the poor, or what it is. Um, but, or less empathy. Uh, but I think you have to see this imprisonment, the, more har the harsher sentencing, as another indication of something going wrong with the quality of social relations in a society uh, which is more unequal. Um, <coughs> what is this? Uh, teenage birth rates, very big differences, going from about five births per thousand women in their teens up to, well, Britain has six times that level, you have uh, uh, four times that level, um, USA ten times that level. Uh, I, I won't be showing you too many more. You've got the story now that more unequal <laughs> countries do worse. Um, but um, this is social mobility and it is an important one because uh, I think some people think that inequality, big inequalities of outcome are justified if everyone can find their right level in society. You know, the idea that if you work hard and you're clever you get up and if you're not you don't. I don't know why there's, a, there's any idea that, uh, uh, well, but what this shows is that uh, the measure of social mobility, sorry, is um, how important your father's income is to how well you do. I'm afraid it's father's and son's income, not mother's and daughter's, because there have been such big changes in women's uh, economic activity rates that it's harder to make the comparison. So they use the national cohort studies and they look at a father's income when a son is born and the son's income 30 years later when the son reaches the age of 30. And basically what they're asking is do rich, sons have, uh, do rich fathers have rich sons and do poor fathers have poor sons? Or isn't there much connection? And what you're seeing here is there's, um, <coughs> father's income is much more important in these more unequal countries and much less important in the more equal ones. We produced this data, this graph, when there were, I think we had one or two less data points on it when we first published it. But since then, um, there have been several more studies confirming this, including one by Alan Kruger, who is the chair of Obama's Economic Advisory Committee, using quite independent data uh, and showing a very similar relationship. Um, so I think it's, it's sound. Um, changes over time. Um, I don't know whether you want that. Uh, it looks as if the effects of rises in income inequality come through at about three, they start to come through three years later. So rise in income inequality and three years later you just start to see the effects and the damage goes on accumulating uh, until about 12 years later. Um, this uh, top one, or that's the marginal effect, this is the cumulative effect on, on mortality. Um, and 
Yeah, I mean, people are often puzzled that uh, health goes on getting better, although in most of our societies we've had rises in inequality. What's happening is that um, uh, we get faster rises in inequality, uh, sorry, faster rises in, in health and life expectancy if we become more equal and slower rises in, in life expectancy if we become less equal. So the most countries uh, improvements in health are slower than they would have been if uh, income differences hadn't increased. There is a background rate of improvement in in public health that nobody really understands. It seems to me it's one of the biggest mysteries in public health. It's not just things that are affected by med medical care, it's much broader than that. Um, <clears throat> and it's now particularly amongst old, older people. Um, people often look at our, our work and think it's very simple and imagine, maybe because it's just simple cross-sectional stuff, uh, there isn't more sophisticated work, but there are hundreds of papers in the journals now, uh, including much more sophisticated analyses, controlling for goodness knows what, uh, multi-level models where you control for individual income. Uh, there are studies looking using multi-level methods, looking at a cohort over time as income inequality changes. So um, don't assume that because we try and make the picture as simple as possible in our book that there is nothing more sophisticated uh, in it. We only did our book when it looked as that to us as if the uh, picture was becoming uh, quite clear in the, in the literature. Now, I've been pointing out how big the differences are in performance of more and less equal countries. You know, sometimes it's only a twofold difference in infant mortality, sometimes threefold differences in mental illness, but sometimes tenfold differences in imprisonment, in some studies of homicide, uh, in infant mortality. So huge differences in how countries perform related to their inequality. That in itself tells us that it can't just be the poor who are affected. You can't get such big differences driven entirely, say, by the poorest 10% of the society at the bottom. These differences are so large because we are all affected. You know, I showed you, do you remember those uh, thin blue bars on the histogram I showed you near the beginning, showing that health inequalities went right across society? Uh, and it, it looks as if uh, the height of all those bars would change um, with uh, greater equality. This, we don't just have to infer that we're all affected from that, those kind of considerations because there are a few studies which allow us to compare people at each level in the social hierarchy between more and less equal countries. So some Swedish researchers, remember more equal Sweden, compared their infant mortality rates by social class uh, with the ones in England and Wales. So England and Wales is, uh, uh, as I said, it's old data, but th that's where our infant mortality rate was um, and the Swedish bars all lower. Now, I said it's by um, occupational class, so it, anachronistically it's by father's occupational class, so single mothers have to go alone in their own category. Here you have the babies of unskilled manual working fathers, semi-skilled manual working fathers, skilled manual, uh, junior clerical, um, intermediate teachers, nurses, people like that and then the professional occupations, um, doctors, lawyers, directors of larger companies in the top. Now you see the blue bars, the Swedish mortality rates are lower all the way across. The biggest difference is at the bottom, but even at the top there seem to be small advantages in being in a more equal society. And you see just the same thing in this, this actually is uh, Doug Wilms, who I think is Canadian too, he produced this a long time ago. Instead of being a classification by occupational class, it's a classification by parents' education. And it's looking at the literacy scores of young people in Sweden, Canada and the US. And uh, uh, so here you've got this end, 
the children of well-educated <coughs> parents, so they're near the top of, of society. And here you've got the children of badly educated parents near the bottom of society. And you see that even at the top, there's a small advantage of being in a more equal society. So Sweden does better than Canada, Canada does better than US. But at the bottom of society, the differences are much larger. Now we've got about half a dozen studies that seem to show that same sort of pattern that the social gradient becomes steeper in more unequal countries, which very much supports what I was saying about the differences in outcome being so large because we're all part <coughs> of this picture. Note that this graph, nor that one, they're not telling you that there are more people at the bottom, not telling you there are more people in unskilled manual uh, um, occupations or more people with badly educated parents. It's saying wherever you come, you do less well. It's not an effect simply of having more poor people or more rich people. Now, people are puzzled that so many things, quite different problems, have the same pattern. But as I said before, they're all problems with social gradients, more common at the bottom of society. And in a sense, all we're saying <coughs> is that problems that we know are related to social status get worse if you increase the, the importance of social status itself. Um, and indeed, I think that part of the process is that um, in more unequal societies there's now data showing that we judge each other more by social status. You know, you're somebody I have to respect or somebody who's not really worth much. Um, if you live in a society where some people are so important and others are worthless. We all become more worried about where, where we are and how we're seen and judged. The social ang valuation anxieties increase. We actually did a paper looking to see whether these effects were, we looked at different death rates. Uh, some like um, breast cancer and prostate cancer don't have strong social gradients. They're just as common at the top of them as the bottom of the society. They are not related to inequality. Um, but uh, the stronger the social gradient, the, the, big, the stronger the relationship with inequality. So it's a sort of sensitivity. <coughs> Things that are sensitive to social status get worse when you increase the social status differences. And the surprise is that they get worse not just amongst the four, but across the whole society. It makes social status, social status anxieties, um, more important all the way through society. In a sense, I think it's whether we live in a, in, in a... It's not something separate from class. It's really telling us that class and status become more important where the material differences are bigger. So whether we're living in a, a society with a steep social pyramid like that, or a much shallower one, I think that's what it's about. So don't start thinking, forget all we know about class and health and status and health. This is something separate to do with inequality. Instead, think that inequality, income inequality, the material differences between us, are in some sense driving the, social, the importance of social class or status. Okay? If you like, think of it as the material differences as the framework uh, or the scaffolding round which all the cultural markers of status are built. You know, the fact that, uh, well, in a more equal society, I guess people would uh, dress more similarly because they couldn't really afford to dress so differently, or houses would be more similar, um, all sorts of things like that. But uh, in a more unequal society, some people can live very differently from others and it becomes immediately apparent whether it's the cars they drive, the clothes they wear, the restaurants they eat at, the books and, you know, as sociologists like Bourdieu said, we, we use income to express social status in many different ways. Um, I'm, I won't skip over to this. The big change in our understanding of the drivers of health over the last, uh, population health over the last 30 years, are how important psychosocial 
factors are. Chronic, working through the biology of chronic stress. Um, and the main groups, I think, of these psychosocial risk factors are things to do with low social status, uh, things to do um, with uh, poor social connections, having few friends, being more isolated, uh, lack of community life and so on. And then uh, stress in early childhood, you know, casting a long shadow forwards over the rest of, of life. I think these three things are telling us, in a way, the same story, that the insecurities that you might have from a difficult early childhood are rather like the insecurities that go with uh, low social status. Feeling you're not valued, the anxieties and insecurities that go with the, both of those. Friendship fits into that because if you have friends, you get positive feedback. You're okay, they like you. You feel appreciated. You feel more an okay kind of person. Whereas if you feel people avoid you, you're excluded, uh, they don't invite you to things, they don't sit next to you. We all immediately have those feelings of, you know, maybe I'm boring, unattractive, socially gauche, they think I'm stupid. Uh, all those worries come crowding in. Uh, and I think that's what's going on behind these uh, three things. I'd put forward that kind of explanation of these in, in a paper a long time ago, and then I found what I hope will be the next slide. Is it? Is it? Uh, yes. Um, this is a study. As we got more interested in the effects of chronic stress, uh, psychologists did numerous experiments inviting volunteers like yourselves into the psychological laboratory, giving you stressful things to do and measuring your cortisol levels, the central stress hormone. You can measure it in saliva or in, in blood. And um, they, these people in their meta-analysis, Dickerson and Kemeny, found 208 of those studies. But in each study they had used different kinds of stressful tasks. So, in some studies you'd be asked to do mathematical problems. Sometimes you'd be asked to read your marks at the end. So, you know, you'd have the embarrassment of having to say you only, you only got two out of ten, or whatever it was. Um, sometimes they videoed you while you did something. Other times you were asked to write about an unpleasant experience. Lots of different stressors were used. And in this meta-analysis, they were asking what kind of tasks in these studies most reliably pushed up levels of stress, ho stress hormones. And they said it was tasks that involved social evaluative threat. In the paper they say threats to self-esteem and social status, where others could negatively judge your performance. <coughs> you know, we hate making fools of ourselves in front of other people. We don't want to look stupid, we don't want to look odd. Um, those are very strong feelings, those feelings of shame and humiliation. Indeed, why violence is more common in more unequal societies is violence is so lo often triggered by loss of face, humiliation, um, uh, people feeling disrespected and looked down on. Um, so I think that almost exactly confirms the interpretation I'd been given, I'd, I'd given to this uh, pattern. Um, more, more recently, um, Sherry Johnson in the United States, a psychologist, has written a huge review paper of mental conditions and personality disorders that she uh, finds evidence are related to what she calls the dominance behavioral system. She says, suggests that human beings, well I don't think suggests that there's other, there are other papers showing this, uh, but human beings, like many other animals, have, if you like, a module of the brain to deal with issues to do with subordination and dominance and so on. And uh, uh, she goes through all sorts of indications that uh, these things, some of these mental uh, conditions are related to uh, subordination and uh, um, uh, dominance and subordination. 
she hadn't yet got to the point of saying that these are worse in more unequal societies, though I have just done a paper with her. Well, she did most of the work. She is the first author uh, showing that uh, these problems, or some of these problems, are worse in more unequal societies, so that bigger inequalities, as I said, make that dimension of society more important. Um, if you think of an animal dominance hierarchy, it's about bullying. The strongest baboon is the top, and it's uh, at the top simply because it can beat up and see off the ones below it in the hierarchy. And the number two tends to be the second strongest, and the ones at the bottom are the weakest. Unfortunately, we don't have um, data, internationally <coughs> comparable data, on bullying amongst adults. But there are several studies where you can look at bullying, compare bullying amongst children in different societies. Um, I'm aware, talking about this, of how much Canadians have contributed. This paper comes from Frank Elgar, um, who's a Canadian researcher, showing, again, in more unequal countries, um, higher levels of bullying and quite big differences, what, nearly fourfold differences in in uh, frequency of bullying amongst children. And there are now several papers showing that pattern. To give you an idea of how deeply this gets into you, this is an old study from, you know, the Whitehall studies, following up civil servants working in London off government offices. Uh, they're classified by employment grade, so the most senior ones are here, most senior men, most junior men, most senior women, most junior women. Uh, this is the levels of, uh, of fibrinogen, which is a blood clotting factor, res which responds to stress. So, you know, if you're wounded, you want your blood to cl clot fast. And if the, the people who study animal dominance hierarchies, the, the subordinate ham animals have many more bite marks. The, 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 what they have to be afraid of is not the lion so much as the dominant baboon or whatever it is. And it's interesting that uh, the, you have um, more fibrinogen, your blood clots faster if you're in um, uh, low status occupations in the civil service. It's almost as if you thought your boss was going to bite you. Um, another thing pointing in the same way, uh, in the, uh, the proceedings of the Royal Society, Statistical Society, um, I think that I said the Royal Society, but I thought it was Royal Statistical Society. Um, uh, there's somebody who shows that women seem to prefer more masculinized faces in more unequal countries. Uh, basically, they took a photograph of a man and then computer enhanced the you know square jawline and a few things like that, and then simply went to women and said, which which do you prefer? Which is most attractive? Uh, and the tendency to prefer the more masculinized face. So I'm suggesting that these things have very deep evolutionary roots. Again and again in epidemiology, social status and friendship uh, appear as a sort of Jekyll and Hyde opposite. Friendship is protective. It's low social status, social status differentiation is damaging. They are the two Opposite ways people can come together. Dominance is about uh, hierarchies, pecking orders, uh, based to orderings based on power, coercion, privileged access to resources, you know, the strongest eat first, all that kind of thing. Friendship is about uh, reciprocity, mutuality, social obligations, sharing, a recognition of each other's needs. You know, I know. Given that we've, as members of the same species, we all have the same needs. We regard the same sorts of things as food. We, uh, you know, whether it's competition in different species for territory or nesting sites, members of the same species are, are always uh, have the potential for conflict, rather as Hobbes said. Um, but uh, um, we also have the potential not only to be each other's worst rivals, but also the potential to be the best source of cooperation, friendship, assistance, love, uh, 
we can be the best or the worst for each other. And why in the epidemiology of friendship, which I initially I would never have imagined that would be important, or the stress of low social status, you know, what on earth has stress got to do with health? We're living in the most comfortable society ever. Why on earth are these people talking about stress? And yet suddenly you come to understand how highly tuned we are to the quality of social relationships. And it's this anthropologist who said gifts make friends and friends make gifts. You know, the gift is the symbol of friendship because it is a very concrete expression that you and I don't fight over access. I recognize your need and your sense that you may reciprocate that gift, which some psychologists suggest is a, is a human universal, that sense of indebtedness and reciprocation. Uh, is like a sort of social compact. Um, you know, it really is at some fundamental level about access to material necessities and the possibility that we fight over everything or that we learn to share. And you even see it in words like companion, or companiero, or compa. Copa. Um, it's about your, your companions are people with whom you share bread, you, you, with whom you, and, and in the religious form, of course. Uh, the, the sharing of the communion, the bread and wine, or the fact that we eat together um, is about not contesting access to basic necessities. You know, these messages are very deeply ingrained in our psychology. Um, friendship on the one hand and things to do with social status. And basically, you know, are we out for what we can get? Do we have to learn not to trust each other, fight for what we can get? Or are we in a society where we depend on cooperation, on reciprocity? Um, and we take the signal, I think, from the scale of social hierarchy and inequality, the quality of social relations growing up. You know, that early sensitive period in childhood, um, sensitive period similarly in many different animals you know if you want a, a cat or a dog that isn't neurotic isn't going to bite you or whatever you get one that's had a decent early puppyhood or kittenhood <laughs> and uh, with with human beings i know that that's early sensitivity is about adaptation to the kind of world you find you've got to deal with and in human beings, that's about the kind of social environment. You know, human beings have lived in everything from the most equal societies of hunters and gatherers, um, with food sharing and gift exchange, to the most awful tyrannies. We've, we've lived through all of them. But which it is, is crucially important. You know, am I in a dog-eat-dog -dog society? Do I have to learn not to trust you people? And you know, whether I'm in a society that depends on reciprocity and cooperation or the opposite, uh, needs quite different emotional and cognitive development. <coughs> and the part of, I think, what parenting does, I don't mean this is conscious in parents' mind, is pass on the experience of adversity. So either you get as a child all that handling, social contact, eye contact, um, and so on of attentive loving parents where you become more socialized good at empathy and all the rest of it or if your parents are depressed too tired to give you much attention or there's domestic conflict uh, you grow up maybe tougher more streetwise but less willing to trust less good at empathy uh, so I think these things get right into early child and, and we now know that some of these things seem to be uh, uh, carried through epigenetic effects. The early environment switches, uh, changes gene expression. Um, so the, your, the, the genetic makeup you have has different effects depending on what sort of uh, environment you're in. I must uh, try and finish that. This um, schizophrenia, didn't I show you that before? Oh yes. This 
nearly finished, as big a social evaluative threat, more worries about how you're seen and judged in a more unequal society, and you know, there are papers that show there's more status insecurity. There are two responses to that. That this is, a, if you like, a more judgmental society based on hierarchy. One is that you feel you're overcome by um, depression, social anxiety, feelings of worthlessness, social contact becomes an ordeal, you gradually withdraw from social life. You don't really feel you can relax unless you're at home alone. The other response to similar worries about how you're seen and judged is to go in for a sort of self-promotion, self-advertisement. Start Instead of being modest about your achievements and abilities, you start doing the opposite. You talk yourself up. You say, I'm really good at this and that and the other. I was one of the youngest people to be promoted. For I went to this uh, famous university and so on. Um, you find narcissism increases with inequality. This is a study of self-enhancement. They might have called it self-advertisement or something. They were asking people in these different societies, how do you compare with the average in your society? Do you think you're cleverer than the average person? Are you more attractive? Um, uh, all sorts of things like that. And in more unequal societies, people rate themselves higher or, or give that impression. Um, so, you, you, one of the costs of inequality is you cease to be modest about your abilities and achievements. I, I think I'd better stop with that um, uh, and not uh, include this. Um. So, I, I hope I've just I've shown you what inequality dis, does and I hope I've given you some idea of the social processes, psychosocial processes under the surface behind the data. Thank you.